uh, nine, nine, nine miles or more. He's not alone. And, uh, do In the desert, it's too dangerous. With him is his Chinese friend, Piao Chejun. Their GPS says they will reach the rare strip of wall in five hours. Let's go. William Lindsay and Piao Chejun trek through the featureless Gobi Desert and grasslands. The sparse vegetation is tinder dry and offers few landmarks. You can see a solitary tree over there. By noon, with the sun burning, they arrive at the place they are looking for. Hey, there it is. We made it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. <laughs> Brilliant. For Lindsay, it's already worth the trip. Amazing, eh? Oh, look at that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Of all the faces that the Great Wall of China has, this is the rarest of them all. This wall is made of wood. See, there's six layers of branches there. And, and in between, minimal use of the gravel. So I'm really glad I've come here today. Well worth a 10 mile trek. But that's only half the story. On the way back, we faced a near-death experience, a Gobi Inferno, and I vowed never to return here. This autumn scene is somewhat misleading. Just beyond extends the most hostile landscape I've ever trekked across during my 35 years of Great Wall explorations. Here's the spoiler, camels. I'm in Gansu province, northwest China, heading deep into the Gobi Desert back on the trail of the British explorer, Aral Stein. In his classic of Central Asian exploration, Ruins of Desert Cathay, Stein recounted his investigation of the westernmost remains of the Han Dynasty Great Wall. He surveyed it with compass, spade and camera. But one tool that Stein didn't have in 1907 was a drone, and neither did I when I was last following in his footsteps here. Today, I'm returning to the most extraordinary section of the Han Wall that Stein photographed, where it's made predominantly of wooden branches. Why am I going back? I'm curious to discover if an aerial view might help answer lingering questions that I have about this miracle section. Why does this fragment alone still stand so high and so well? after so long. Well, I'm really excited. This is the third time I've been to the wooden wall. And it's certainly the easiest approach of the three. Uh, two previous approaches, 15K trek each way, 30K total. The first was very successful. The second was an absolute nightmare with a film crew that ignored my uh, advice on how much water to bring. And on that uh, late July day in 2010, the temperature in this area in the afternoon on the trek back reached 46. Me, my assistant Piao and the cameraman Toby were the only ones that made it back. The others had to be rescued. And this is what we trekked uh, over the desert for. It's the best preserved wooden wall in the whole of China. In fact, I think it's the best preserved Han Dynasty Great Wall in the whole of China. From this side, this side, it doesn't look as high as it does in the Aral Stein photograph of 1907. And that's because it's the other side. Yeah, a wall has two sides. The other side, it looks much, much higher. So we're going there right now. Come on. 
I first came here in 2007, searching for the place where Stein had taken his superb photograph. Can we go across there? And when I came face to face with the wall here, I immediately dubbed it the Wooden Wall, a name that stuck. Camels have been crossing here. And uh, some footprints there yeah. as well. Take a look at this. Wow. What's special about this wall? Well, just look at the surface here. Look at this. There are distinct layers of woody material interspersed with the gravel. And this is certainly the, uh, the remains of what was a much higher wall. And this wood, it's remarkable to think that was cut 2,100 years ago during the Western Han Dynasty. Absolutely amazing. Why is this wall so rare? Because it's a prime example of how resourceful the builders were at the time. They used what they had in their locality. And as we look at this wall now, we can only see the gravel and the wood. One thing we can't see that made this wall possible was water. Without water, these layers could not have been compacted. This is Gobi Desert, but there is water nearby. The watch stations, the towers, dotted along the line of this wall, several kilometers apart, were manned. And the soldiers of the frontier, of course, not only needed food and weapons, but they needed water to keep themselves alive and to build the wall. Totally remarkable. So happy to come here today. I'm going to walk the full length. Up close, I'm struck by how thick, straight, horizontal and neatly arranged the wooden layers are. From above, the straightness of this section is really striking. It cuts right across a stony plain, flanked by tamarisk cones at both ends. Stein described the wall here as having a quasi-petrified consistency. Even though 21 centuries is a blink of the eye compared to geological time, the branches here do seem to have become fossilised already. There are no other sections of wooden wall. I think the use of tamarisk wood here might have been a construction material experiment and, as time has told, it's been a very successful one. Stein believed that the wall's remarkable state of preservation here was, I quote, evidently due to a protecting cover of sand. Could the wall have been buried by windblown sand and then unveiled many centuries later? Explanations as to why this mysterious wall is so well preserved are numerous. The uniqueness of its material, the petrification of the wood and the gravel, burial, and unveiling. Whatever its survival story may be, there's no doubt that it truly stands out as a miracle section of the Great Wall. <laughs>